our series for Economics 193, John Maynard Keynes, from Classical to Keynesian Economics. Keynes was born in 1883 in Cambridge, England. He was the son of John Neville Keynes, professor of economics at Cambridge University. He won a scholarship to Eton, a very elite school, and was considered to be a boy genius uh, during his time. He won prizes for his work in math and history, um, wrote papers on contemporary social problems, uh, was an athlete, participated in crew, debated, acted, read everything voraciously could get his hands on, and he became an expert in medieval Latin poetry. He was considered part of Eaton's social elite, and he won a scholarship to King's College in Cambridge. After college, he studied economics for maybe a year, but he did poorly on most of his exams and went on to become a civil servant, working in the Indian office for two years. In 1908, his father got him a job as a lecturer at King's College, where he later became a fellow. In 1911, he became editor of the Economic Journal, and he worked at the Treasury during World War I. It was through his work at the Treasury where he actually represented England at the negotiations at the Treaty of Versailles. And here, there was a great amount of influence, right, on what was called the Great War, or World War I. He was that representative of the Finance Department at the Versailles Peace Conference, However, most countries irritated with Germany and their aggression during World War I felt that Germany should pay for all of the war debt incurred by everyone. However, Keynes argued against reparations and said that this type of an action would crush the German economy and would cause even more conflict. And from this he published in 1919 the economic consequences of peace in this Triste talked about and proved to be correct that these reparations against Germany would cause the German people to eventually uprise and would create more violence. He also wrote that in 1923, a tract on monetary reform, and in 1930, a Triste on money. But let's look at what happened with Keynes during the years in between the war. His economic consequences of peace in 1919 regarding these reparations was a bestseller, and it made him a public celebrity, right? And in 1923, he wrote the tract on monetary reform, which was against returning to the pre-war gold standard that had been removed in the United States by Woodrow Wilson. He also said the economic consequences of Winston Churchill and warned against this, right? He, he warned of a depression in 1925 that was going to occur from the government's fiscal policies. And in 1930, he wrote a treaty on money. Ironically, John Maynard Keynes made, lost, and then turned around to make millions on the stock market, commodities, and foreign exchange markets. All of the studying over the years that Keynes had done had helped him to learn about business cycles and enabled him to amass a fortune. And finally, in 1936, Keynes writes his epic work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. Let's look at what was going on in economics in the late 20s and early 30s. Of course, the stock market crash and Great Depression, which ensued in the early 1930s, one of the longest droughts ever to hit the Midwest, the Dust Bowl displaced hundreds of thousands of farming families, and there needed to be a great deal of New Deal policies, and Keynesian economics is born from the general theory of employment, interest, and money. Keynes' main theories is that he relates the money supply, variability, and uncertainty to inflation and deflation. So he claims that it is the amount of uncertainty Right in the economic system that exists that causes inflation and deflation. And this variability of prices is the major cause of these wild swings in the business cycle. Wages and other cost of productions adjust more slowly than prices. And price, therefore, is the variable that affects profits and investment. And investment cycles cause business cycles. So if you want governments to or if you want companies to invest and create jobs, 
the government needs to step in to stimulate demand through spending. Policymakers should manipulate those government expenditures to achieve the desired level of aggregate demand. And in times of turndown, this can be achieved through lowering tax rates and increasing government spending. According to Keynes, governments should incur deficits and borrow money in times of turndowns, and these can be repaid through higher taxation that will be received in the times of economic growth. When we look at the business cycle, we look at the different periods that occur between boom, slump, re recession, and recovery, and peak. And what do we know? That the recurring boom and bust cycles um, in economic performance affect the economy, and all economies face them. Deep, long busts are called depressions. And John Maynard Keynes felt that it was the role of the government to both ease these huge downturns, right, and to keep the peaks from overheating. Huge depression cycles in America, and everyone knows the, the panic that occurs in 1929. However, there were multiple U.S. depressions that pr lasted for protracted periods. 1819, 1836, 1857, 1873, 1893, not to mention in, in, in 1909 when, um, when Vanderbilt had to save uh, the banking system, a brief one in 1921, and of course in 1929, the Great Depression. It's important to note that other than 2008, we had not had a Great Depression that has occurred since then. Why? Well, Let's look at what caused the Great Depression. And the first one we called the boom of the Roaring Twenties, a huge period of consumption, right? Government policies favored business and the wealthy, huge concentration of wealth increases and the gap between rich and poor increase, and we become overly dependent on what we call conspicuous consumption. There was a speculative run on the stock market, huge margin trading. Prior to legislation that's passed by the Roosevelt administration, margin could be traded on up to 90% of the value of what you held. Leverage purchase stocks were bought with borrowed money. Rampant, undisciplined speculation and stock prices had become unrealistically high. Secondly, we had some really poor business practices and the first of which was this huge land speculation in Florida. Much like what happened in 2008, today, resort developments were multiplying in Florida and cash flush banks and corporations and wealthy individuals were making huge investments in these um, beachfront properties that eventually would bust. Um, in the early 1930s, at the time when the stock market crashes, the land bubble in Florida explodes. Most of this was bought on credit, land prices quadrupled, huge paper profits, and the slowing economy after the stock market crash in, in October of 1929, there was a huge sell-off and falling prices created a credit crisis. And this collapse of the whole Florida land market ensued and large investors, including banks, lost enormous paper assets and so now we've got a slowing economy and a land bubble collapse and the stock market crash, right? The stock market destroys huge amounts of paper wealth in 1929 as these values plummet. And unfortunately, the stocks and their value could no longer cover these huge collateral requirements of having bought on margin. So guess what? Margin calls start. Now the brokerage houses want their money. And guess what? Depositors have to go and withdraw cash from banks to cover their margin calls on their stocks. And this causes a banking crisis. Banks are unable to pay depositors. There's a panic. There are literal runs on banks. Banks fail. Remember, at this time, in 1929 and 1930, there is no insurance and no government intervention into the bank failures. So if you had money in a bank and it failed, you lost all your money. 
deposits were uninsured, and many depositors lost their entire life savings. This caused a further downward spiral of the Depression. The newly wealthy find themselves newly poor. Consumer spending plummets on everything, including luxury items. New orders dry up, producers lay off workers, and working classes lose income and decrease spending. Believe it or not, at this time, up to 25% of the total U.S. workforce is laid off. In larger cities like Chicago and Detroit, it's estimated that up to 50% of the workforce did not have a job. And the government's policies regarding the economic turmoil made matters worse. Congress decided that the best way to help out during this time was to actually shut off imports. And so Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which in essence, right, caused the world to stop doing business with the United States. And in response to this, foreign countries stopped buying from America, which further brought the business cycle down. The government response at this time, Herbert Hoover is president of the United States. His, he was a classical economist. He wanted to wait for the market to correct itself. When asked about pump priming, he said maybe, but he never did it. His dominant economic pro paradigm, laissez-faire, let it be. And government will just make, mess it up and make it worse. And that is, in fact, the case. Believe it or not, his lack of action and intervention into this caused the recession to get even deeper. It did not fix itself. Again, he thought the invisible hand, competition and profit motives would correct things, right? The economy would tend towards efficient equilibrium if it was left alone, and the government shouldn't meddle. And again, Ricardo systematized Smith's work and said, guess what? Government spending cannot stimulate economic performance. Stimulation would be, in essence, counterbalanced by offsetting taxes and offsetting savings. King said not so. In his magnum opus, The General Theory of Employment and Interest in Money, he challenged those paradigms, stating that markets won't always tend towards an equilibrium at full employment, and government has a role in stimulating economic performance by stimulating aggregate demand. Right? Financial shocks and gloomy expectations could permanently suppress aggregate expenditures. So in essence, what he was saying is this depression could be a long-term outcome it may never fix itself or take years upon years. Large-scale unemployment in both human and capital could result, and it could take decades to recover under free market economics. He says we've got to stimulate aggregate demand. Only the government is capable of sufficient, massive stimulation of expenditures. In other words, he said during a depression, neither firms who have excess capacity or consumers, 25% of whom at this time are out of work, have sufficient resources to stimulate the economy. The government should and actually needs to spend their way out of a depression. And it was counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Cut taxes and increase spending in a recession or depression, and increase taxes and cut spending in times of inflationary expansion. Keynes begins to write open letters in, starting in 1933 to President Roosevelt, stating, broadly speaking, therefore, an increase of output can occur only by the operation of one of three factors. One, individuals are induced to spend more, but they don't have it, or businesses are induced to spend more by increasing their capital employment, but they have excess capacity and don't have orders to justify it, or the government must create additional current incomes through the expenditure of borrowed or printed money. He challenges Roosevelt. Thus, as a prime mover in the first stage of the technique of recovery, I lay overwhelming emphasis on the increase of national purchasing power resulting from governmental expenditures, which is financed by loans and not merely a transfer through taxation from existing incomes. He warns the president that the setback American recovery experienced this past autumn 
was the predictable consequence of the failure of your administration to organize any material increase in new loan expenditures during your first six months in office. The position six months hence will depend entirely on whether you have been laying the foundations for larger expenditures in the future. Guess what? Roosevelt reads these policies and his policies begin to mirror what Keynes suggests. They called it the alphabet soup for all of the different acronyms that were used for the policies starting in 1934 that President Roosevelt started working on in the New Deal, including the three C's, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the WPA, the REA, Rural Electrification Administration. Roosevelt puts together New Deal programs to aid farmers. He authorizes the Resettlement Administration to get farmers out of these farms that had now become decimated by the Dust Bowl. He, he starts the Farm Security Administration for rehabilitation of areas. He starts the REA, or Rural Electrification Administration, to bring electricity to farms and the Tennessee Valley Authority, one of the most aggressive dam building electrification programs ever in the United States in the Tennessee Valley. In addition, the New Deal put people to work in every state in the Union. King's model, scientific justification for the New Deal, theoretical guide for the New Deal, and confidence that short-term deficits were okay to stop long and protracted recessions and depressions. The Fresno Auditorium, the Alameda Oakland Bridge, the Hoover Dam. Look at what was done in Minnesota alone. 1,266 projects, 65,713 people employed, and $31 million in expenditures in 1936. Unbelievable what was done across the nation with the WPA. Many of the parks that we still enjoy to this day were created during this time. In addition, in the 1930s, social programs were in, initiated to ensure that wage floors were created, including unemployment benefits, social security insurance, a progressive income tax system, and all these were the automatic stabilizers for the economy that Keynes had discussed in his work. In addition, President Roosevelt strengthened labor laws to protect labor unions and workers' rights to organize, to improve the distribution of income, and avoid the inequalities that made the 20s boom so volatile, um, and implemented the minimum wage in 1938. In addition, he, in the 1930s, the Securities and Exchange Commission was strengthened to guard against stock market schemes and collapses, tighter accounting and reporting policies for publicly traded corporations, tighter controls on initial public offerings and underwriting of stock issues, and limits were placed on margin trading. Finally, they strengthened controls on insider trading, all of these done to avoid collapses in the stock market that had happened in 29. However, other major safeguards were taken since it was deemed that a majority of what happened during the Great Depression was caused, in fact, by the collapse of the banking system. The Federal Reserve Board was strengthened, and the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, began to make sure that depositors' money would be protected in the event of a bank failure. Specifically, Glass-Steagall, amendment was passed in the Banking Act of 33 and it prohibited four specific activities from commercial banks participating. The first is known as dealing in non-government securities for customers. The second is investing in non-investment grade securities for themselves. The third is underwriting or distributing non-governmental securities and the fourth is affiliating or sharing employees with companies involved in these activities. President Clinton publicly declared these no laws as no longer appropriate, and in 1999, the graham leach Bailey Act repealed the restrictions created in Glass-Steagall between banks and security firms. And I want you to remember this later on because these become extremely important regarding the housing market collapse that occurs in 2008. Let's move on.
Keynes continued to influence the economy even after the Great Depression. He is in large part responsible for devising the funding mechanisms of the debt required to wage World War II against Germany. And in 1944, he is a key, and 46, he's a key in getting countries to participate in the Bretton Woods Summit. The Bretton Woods Summit resulted in the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, and the creation of the World Bank. At the conclusion of this summit, and shortly after, John Maynard Keynes dies from complications from an infection that affected his heart. However, these policies, Keynesian economics, and these international banking organizations continue to this day to influence the world's economy. Keynes model success, well, first of all, created less volatile business cycles. No major depressions since implementation. Greater economic security for working political stability in advanced world economies where Keynesian policies are practiced. Institutions he helped create change the world's economic situation. And in fact, prior to the economic meltdown of 2008, we had nearly 75 years of a relatively stable economy. Uh, the model has its detractors, right? It's believed that there are inflationary tendencies that this creates and that it is only through inflation that we get growth, right? And deficit spending. Again, tax cuts and tax increases intended to balance each other out were not necessarily followed and are hard, and especially tax increases, which are hard to sell for elected officials. In addition, government deficits compete with private investment, right, for investment money. And there's something called the crowding out effect, where the more government deficit there is, the less money there is available for private investment, right? The government sector continues to grow because of, of Keynesian economics, and it's inconsistent with a Lockean view of minimalist government. Government can become more intrusive, and there's always the danger of government growing too big, and the economy actually becoming what's known as a control economy. There were critics of John Maynard Keynes, and most importantly is Frederick Hyatt who was one of Keynes' contemporaries. Keynes was a true classical economist. And the two who lived at equal times had totally different ideas gleaned from the same data. Hayek suggested that the government should not attempt to either control the economy, interest rates, or the money supply. And it was after the, the, the issues with the gold standard in 1919 that caused all of the economic problems to begin with. Keynes ruled until his theories failed at the end of the recession, or failed to end the recession and stagflation of the 1970s. And then the work of Frederick Hayek became some of the most popular work amongst politicians, most of, in, 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 mostly including Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And it was by much of his theory and arguments that he made that the world is lifted out of stagflation by roughly the end of 1984. Hayek's work is so impressive that he actually receives the Nobel Prize in 1974. In addition, we had monetary and supply side theorists focusing on tax incentives for investment. People like Milton Friedman believed that by reducing the tax burden, right, and stimulating government to invest in new jobs and new technologies. But through it all, um, both the tax cuts failed to balance with reduced spending, and it left large deficits that counteracted expected benefits. During our most recent crisis, well, we thought that automatic stabilizers were well entrenched to smooth out the wide swings in the business cycle. Monetarist anti-inflation program, Bernanke was unable to stop the banks and insurance and financial institution meltdown. One, because governments caved into the businesses and to Wall Street, fearing a gigantic depression. And two, changes in the laws relating to financial risk that they had themselves enacted that potentially had started this snowball in early 2000. Followers of Hay claimed that it was the cheap interest rates all along and, and lack of a gold standard that actually caused the collapse in 2008. But Keynes is still key. As we noted, 
Despite these important later develops in theory and practice, it were the Keynesian economics methods that were used to hold the economy together during the 2008 financial crisis. Hank Monitor's theory, supply-side neoclassical theories, contemporary microeconomic theory and policy are firmly grounded in Keynes' ideas from the 1930. He was the one who created macroeconomic theory. He is still the most important economic theorist in the last hundred years.